Hey everyone, thanks for being with us this weekend and just checking us out online here at Central. Um, we uh, began last weekend with an amazing weekend, kind of just talking through um, where we're going to go in 2022 and beyond. And we kind of just talked about what mission looks like for us as a church. And we talked about the mission of the church that Jesus gave to the early disciples and gave to us. And it talks about the idea of go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And we talked about what that means specific for us as a church here at Central. And then we talked about, we, we, we um, announced the word of the year and the phrase for the year and, and just talked about vision and, and all that sort of stuff last weekend. So if you weren't able to be with us last weekend, then let me encourage you, um, as soon as we get done this weekend, to go over and check out last weekend because you can kind of get caught up more to speed because there's only so much review I can do right now. But I do want to kind of give a review, um, even, even a little bit more in depth than what I just talked about. Like I said, the word of the year um, is the word home. And the whole idea of this is we kind of use the idea of a GPS. And, and on my GPS, and I'm not sure about yours, but on mine, and most GPSs that I'm aware of, you, you, if you want to, you can have a place on where it says home. And you hit on home, and it'll take you, it'll pop up where you need to go to get you home. And we talked about how the Word of God, from beginning to end, is our roadmap. It's how for us to get home. And, and we dealt with this whole idea that um, something we kind of talked about last year, at the end of 2021, how if we really understood and really got more excited about the opportunity of one of those gifts that we receive when we surrender our life to Christ, and that is the gift of eternal life, the gift of home, if we understood that more, if we, if we really got more excited about that, then we would have an understanding and get more excited and be more passionate about the mission that God has given to us to go and make disciples. And so they kind of link together, and as we go through this year, we're going to hopefully see how all that kind of comes together. And then we talked about that our phrase for the year, if you will, is for home. In other words, everything we do is for home. Everything we do is to leave home. And it's kind of like this idea that, hey, where are you going? Well, I'm going home. Hey, let's go home. Uh, let's, let's head home together. And, and it's kind of that concept. And we, we dove into that a little bit last weekend. And again, as we go throughout this year, um, that's our theme. This is our word for the year, our phrase for the year, and kind of the direction we're going. But then we talked about, okay, here's the mission of the church. But then for us individually, as the church, what does that look like for us? In other words, who are we in the mission? And in the whole body of Christ, in the, in the body of the church, who are we? And we, we, we broke out this phrase that says we are a community that's in love with Jesus. And we all said last weekend that I asked, could we be in love with Jesus? And everybody said, yes, we can. we're a community that can be in love with Jesus in such a way that we influence our neighbor. So in other words, can we strive to be in love with Jesus in such a way that's influencing our neighbor? And who's our neighbor? It's, in other words, anyone we're coming in contact with, that we're in love with Jesus in such a way that we're influencing our neighbor to find and experience the healing love of Jesus. We are a community in love with Jesus in such a way that influences our neighbor to find and experience the healing love of Jesus. And that's where we kind of landed um, last weekend. And again, let me encourage you to go back and check out last weekend's teaching. But then we even dove into this a little deeper. We said, okay, this is who we are. Here's the mission. This is who we are. But now, how are we going to accomplish this? How are we going to do it? In other words, so often, culture is influencing us. Where we do life, we, we allow, wherever we do life, where it be work, at home, at school, whatever that looks like for us, we allow that to influence us. And so, how do we start to influence culture? 
How do we influence the culture at work? How do we influence our community? How do we influence our circle of influence that we're in? How do we influence them? How do we do this? And we went over to Micah 6, 8. And in Micah 6, 8, this is Micah's response to the people when, when uh, they were saying, okay, so what does God want? How do we do this? What does God want? And this is the answer that Micah gave me. He says, no, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you. To do what is right. In other words, some translations might say to act justly. And to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. So over the next year, in 2022, as our word is home and everything we do is for home and who we are, we're a community that's in love with Jesus in such a way that's influencing our neighbor to find and experience the healing love of Jesus. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to act justly. We're going to love mercy and we're going to walk humbly with God. And that's how we're going to influence our culture over the next year. And we even dug into that a little deeper. We said, okay, so act justly is, is the mental health part of it. And we're going to influence culture through, through, through influencing the mental health. And then we're going to influence culture through loving um, by, um, uh, to love mercy is the, the physical health of our community. And then to walk humbly is the spiritual health of our community. So how healthy are we? And, and and in actuality, these are all spiritual. You know, you can't separate the uh, uh, the mental from the physical to the spiritual. We we like to do so. We 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 set, try to separate all. In fact, we really we concentrate more on one or the other instead of realizing that it's all part of who we are and our dynamics as our very being with God is our mental, physical. And spiritual health. It all is connected. So this weekend, what I want to do in, in this first part, if you will, of our, um, our values of how we're going to do this, our strategy of how we're going to do this, is to act justly. It's kind of break that down as we influence culture, as we act justly, as we, as we Share and influence through the mental health aspect. How healthy are we as a community, as a church? How healthy are we as a community um, out in our community where God has planted us right here in this part of North Carolina? How healthy is our mental health? And I, I want to just dive into this and act just by just talking about something that a lot of times in the church we haven't talked about and we haven't really, for whatever reason, the church is kind of lollygagged around, and, and that's the only word I think of, lollygagged around in this idea. Of we kind of haven't really caught up to speed with this idea of mental health. And that's kind of where I want to plant ourselves this weekend, because all throughout Scripture, we see this aspect of spiritual growth. We see this aspect in relationship to God. So I just want to start by the whole idea of um, just, I remember the very first time I ever came in contact and ever really dealt with, if you will, on a personal level with losing someone because of suicide was actually, if I'm not mistaken, my senior year in high school where we had a classmate um, that committed suicide and how we had to walk through that as a class and how the community had to walk through that. I, I and think down through times in my ministry where um, uh, ministering to families that lost loved ones and community that lost people that were um, really influential in that community and really involved in that community that had committed suicide and being a part of, um, whether it be leading in that funeral or just being a part of loving on that family or, or those individuals during that time. There is a, if you will, there is a, I know we're in a pandemic, and, but uh, of, of with COVID and all that, but there's also a, a pandemic, if you will. And let me just speak into this thing with pastors and ministers and, and, and leaders within the church. There is a, a pandemic, if you will, of ministers 
and pastors that are uh, that are from a suicide perspective, from depression, anxiety, and and leaving ministry, and all the struggles and everything like that. This is something we should have been talking about a long time ago in the church. It's something we should have dealt with, and we have, for whatever reason, we have really been behind on this. But may we not be a church, may we not be part of the church that is behind, but is actually influencing church culture and our community culture and influencing on the idea of acting justly by looking and loving in the aspect of mental health. We don't like to talk about mental illness in the church for whatever reason. Because I really don't get it. Because if you really dive into scripture, if you look at scripture, scripture is filled with men and women all throughout scripture who struggled with emotional, uh, with their feelings and, and with mental illness and with anxiety and with depression and even even with the idea of suicide. One in five adults in the U.S. experience mental illness. One in 25 live in severe mental illness. One in five children ages of 13 to 18 have or will have a serious mental illness. 90% of those who have died by suicide had an underlying mental illness. So they were struggling, they struggled with depression, or, or depression is the leading cause of disability in the world. Think about that. When you look at suicide and you break down the, the, the demographics and all that, uh, the, suicide, the suicide rate is four times higher for males than females. In the United States, male deaths make up almost 80% of all suicide deaths. The suicide rate is one in eight times higher in rural America than in urban America. If I break that down into the age groupings, um, and you're tracking with me here, and the age groupings are the leading cause of death, yeah, ages 10 to 14, suicide is the third leading cause of death. Ages 15 to 34, it's the second leading cause of death. Ages 35 to 44, it's the fourth leading cause of death. If you fall into the age gap of 45 to 54, it's the fifth leading cause of death. Ages 55 to 64, it's the eighth leading cause of death, and 65 and older, it's the 17th leading cause of death. People are dying by suicide. Now what I, I want to just look at here, and, and just encourage you to take notes, and maybe we just, can we just make a pledge now, if you will? Yeah, I don't know if you will, just um, a commitment, um, if you will, that we do not hear to these myths that I'm about to talk about. There are myths that that have, for whatever reason, have made their way in the church or, or things that we think of or things that we might say within the church or within our Christian dynamics that are just not true. The first thing is we need to stop believing that depression is a faith issue. We need to stop believing that depression is a faith issue. That true followers of Christ, true followers uh, that have surrendered their life to Christ, that they should not and they do not suffer from depression. And that's just not true. In fact, I think it is one of the worst lies of all that we can actually share as a church or as a Christian culture, as a followers of Christ. It is a fake, it, it is a lie that Satan tries to use that it's just one of those many lines that Satan tries to use to push people away. And it's just not true. It's just not. If you look again all throughout Scripture, we see followers of Christ that struggled, struggled with anxiety, that struggled with depression, that struggled, struggled with suicide. See, Christians are never promised a pain-free, disease-free, 
struggle-free life. I don't really know where that ideology or, if you will, that doctrine made its way into the church, that if I surrender my life to Christ, that if I become a follower of Christ, that I won't have any worries anymore, I won't have any problems anymore, I won't have any anxiety, I won't have any concerns, that my life is all going to be just, just be amazing. I don't know where we came up with that idea. I don't know how it made its way into the ideology of the church. But again, it's a lie. It's not true. We are promised a Savior. We are promised a Comforter. We are promised a friend. But we are never, never, never promised a life that would not be pain-free or disease-free or struggle-free. See, depression has nothing to do with our lack of faith. In fact, what I've learned down through the years is so often, whether it be in my own life or watching through other people's lives, is that because of that depression or because of that hardship or because of that anxiety problem, it actually leads people into the presence to, in Jesus in a way that actually strengthens their faith or has strengthened their faith. So we got to stop believing the depression, that believing that depression is a faith issue. We need to stop. Here's number two. We need to stop believing the depression can be prayed away. Now, for you that, that know me really, you know, y'all know, I, I am, I, 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 I believe in prayer. I believe in being very specific in prayer. And what I'm saying here is, is that in, in the times that we are dealing with depression or family members or friends or, or as we pray over people that we, we, again, we should be praying for freedom from depression. We should be praying for freedom of anxi from anxiety, from mental illness. But at the same time, sometimes. We have to go beyond the prayer. In other words, I like to say we, we got to, again, put feet on our prayers. Sometimes we need to rally around the support of, of counseling or even the idea of medication. See, as followers of Christ, we have to be willing at times to take the next steps. Yes, we immerse it in prayer. Yes, we need to be very specific about it in prayer. But we also need to put feet on our prayers. And if we and, and God has blessed us with with counseling and and so much um, education and wisdom behind now dealing with de depression and anxiety and, 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 and medication and all these things. There's a lot of research now to give us a greater understanding. Of the disease of depression. So we do pray. And we need to be very specific in our praying. But we also need to put feet on our prayers and be prepared. Third thing is we need to stop believing that depression isn't physical. We need to stop believing that depression, that depression isn't physical. Just as we need uh, uh, to never, or I would never, or we would never shame anyone that had been diagnosed with a, a cancer or, or someone that was struggling, uh, that was a diabetic or, or had another uh, illness or sickness or something. It's the same thing is true with depression. And anxiety and worry. The brain is a powerful tool. And sometimes, just like those that have been diagnosed and are battling cancer or, or battling, battling um, different diseases or whatever that might be, the same thing can be true. For battling the illness of depression. The idea of battling mental illness. Because it is an illness. The 
There are many causes for depression. Some of it may be rooted in trauma. Some of it may be dealing with hormones. Maybe it's coming about from stress. But whatever it is, it, it, it almost always affects our body. See, our perspective of depression needs to change so that we can learn to embrace and support those that are doing in it instead of pushing them away. So we need to stop believing that depression is a faith issue. We need to stop believing in the myth that depression can be prayed away. We need to stop believing that depression isn't physical. But we also need to stop believing that depression shouldn't be talked about. That's why we're talking about it this weekend. It's like this thing that's just not discussed. And I realize that there's, there's a stigma that's there with when you deal with, when, when you start to talk through anxiety and you start to, to reveal that maybe you're struggling with depression or you struggle with this aspect of worry or anxiety, whatever it looks like. I realize we have moved, uh, we've really grown in a culture where it's not a, a, as much of a stigma and uh, different people have come out talking about it and all that, but I realize it still is something that is, that is looked at a lot of times in stigma. In fact, I just recently listened to a, um, a conversation between two pastors, and one of the pastors was sharing, he just released a book. I don't remember when I off the top of my head the, the name of the book, but he just released a book that's actually dealing with this very subject. I'll try to get it out to you, uh, go back and do some research to get the name of the book out. But he just released this book and talking about that, how he, through since the age of six, has been dealing with um, anxiety and depression. In fact, he even talked about that for 45 days straight. I can't even envision this, but for 45 days straight that he struggled with, a, um, with, with having an anxiety attack for 45 days straight. See, we got to stop believing that depression is one of those things we just shouldn't talk about. There is no shame. Hopefully you're taking notes. And I want you to write these down in big letters in your notes. There is no shame in feeling depressed. And we should learn to talk about it. We should learn and, and listen to this. Pastors, ministers, uh, teachers of the words we need to write. We, we should not be ashamed to preach about or to sing about. Scripture is filled with passages, again, of men and women who struggled through the pit of depression. And what was their response? If you look through Scripture and look at the different individuals that struggled with depression, the struggle with worry, the struggle with anxiety, what was their response? Over and over and over again, the response was to cry out. To cry out. But see what happens so often for those of you that know that you're dealing with this weekend with depression, you're dealing with anxiety, you're dealing with worry, you know that what happens, actually the opposite, instead of crying out, and what do we do? We, we retreat. We, we go into our bubble, if you will. We retreat. And actually, one of the things that comes about from depression and anxiety, because people are not willing to talk about it, because of the fear to talk about it, because of how people will look at us, how people will, even within the church, and the church community will look at If we actually talk about that, hey, I am struggling with depression. I am struggling with mental illness. I struggle with uh, bipolarism. I struggle with this, or, or I struggle... We don't talk about it. Therefore, we are lonely. And then we fall into this trap of this prison of loneliness. And we just sink deeper and deeper and deeper into this grip of depression and loneliness. And anxiety, and it grips on us. You see, there's healing in crying out. There's healing in talking about it. There's healing in doing life together in it. 
So here's the thing. May we create an environment here at Central as we act justly, as we become influencers in gauging the mental health of our community, the, the community of, of us as a church, and as a community as a whole, as we may, may we create an environment where we embrace those who are struggling in pain, rather than pushing people away. Whether, whether instead of creating an environment where people are afraid to talk about it, that we create an environment where people feel safe actually to talk and they feel safe to actually cry out. May we learn to be a community where we can be transparent. We talked about this some last weekend that, you know, in our homes, now, now, sometimes maybe not, um, maybe even because of different individuals that's in your home, you still wear your mask, but for a lot of us, maybe in our home, if you will, and I realize there's, you know, there's just tracking with me on this whole idea of home, that when we get home, you know, you are who you are in your home, and that's the place that we, we, we try to at least remove our mask to, to, to if even, even in the, some dynamics of who might be there, we, we, in other words, church should be a place where you don't wear a mask, where you be who God created you to be, whatever that looks like, where you can experience free love, grace, and mercy. May we be a church culture, a church culture influencing the culture as we act justly. Why? For home. For everything we do is for home. Everything we do is for home. Now, I want, if you will, just to encourage you to, to just skim over and look over with me over at 1 Kings chapter 19. Real quickly, 1 Kings chapter 19, and while, you, while you're getting there, I just want to set the stage uh, because 1 Kings 19 is dealing with this whole idea in, in the life of Elijah. You see, Elijah has a reputation for being, um, if you will, he has a, a, a reputation for being a little arrogant. Elijah is kind of a big deal, and he doesn't really hide it. He knows it. But after Elijah experiences this huge victory, if you're familiar with the life of Elijah, he experiences this huge victory. He's watching God move uh, over the prophets of Baal. And we see this over in 1 Kings chapter 19. And, and Queen Jezebel threatens him, and Elijah is filled with panic. And, and actually, we see that Elijah has, if you will, this panic attack. That he would assume that if you were in the feet, in, in the shoes of Elijah, and, and what Elijah had just experienced, and actually watching God rain down fire from heaven, and watching God answer his prayer, <coughs> excuse me, and watching God use him, and watching all that has been accomplished, you would think that. Elijah, and again, he was kind of known to be um, a little bit of all that and a little bit more, and actually he knew that, but we see this in his time of his life that he has this panic attack. And he becomes consumed with fear because Jezebel has threatened to kill him. So what does Elijah do instead of standing up to Queen of Jezebel? Elijah actually goes on the run. He runs to the wilderness. But also, I want you to see what God does through Elijah and with Elijah. And there's a couple of things we can learn how to help to minister to those that we come in contact with and we do life with that 
are dealing with, whether it be a panic attack or whether it be bipolar or whether it be um, whatever that looks like, and maybe it's depression, anxiety, whatever that looks like, how just some things and how I just want you to open up your minds and, and, and just encourage you this week and allow God to speak and, and to dream and maybe just to write down on your notes as different things maybe as God and, and maybe go back and look later what you wrote down in your notes um, that maybe God is speaking to you of different ways that we can minister, that we can influence culture, that we can act justly influencing in mental health in our community. And here's just a couple of things we learned. How oh, God ministers to Elijah. In verse 1 of chapter 19, in verse Kings, it says, When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Verse 3 says, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might, now I want you to underline this, circle this, he said, pray that he might die. This is the state that Elijah in. Elijah is so full of anxiety, he's out of place that he wants to die. He says, I've had enough, Lord, he said. And this is what he says to God. He says, I've had enough. I want you to take my life. For I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then what does he do next? We see there, verse 5 says, then he, this is Elijah, he lay down and he slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel, now I want you to circle that, an angel, and then underline what the angel does. The angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. Elijah wakes up, and this is why, look at verse 6, says, he looked, up, he looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate, and he drank, and he lay down again. Now, I want you to put, uh, so I want you to underline that where it says he ate and drank, and then I want you to put a circle around where he lay down again. And then go on to verse 7, it says, Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up. Eat some more. And, and then I want you to put a box around this. It says, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. In other words, what is the angel saying to Elijah? I Here's your food. Elijah, you need to eat and you need to rest. And then the angel tells him why. He get, tells him, do you notice this? He says, because... Get this, I have something for you. You're about to go on a journey. Your life is not done yet. Your life is not in yet. God still has something for you. But before we go there, I need you to eat and I need you to drink. I need you to rest. But it's very important that we acknowledge and that you highlight some way that the angel is telling me that Elijah is about to go on a journey. But this is what you need to do to prepare for this journey. Verse 8 says, this is what Elijah does. So he got up and he ate and he drank. And the food, get this, the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. Now, we'll get... We'll get on to this in a minute. We'll, we'll get on to, the, to a, a little bit more of that story. But I want to stop here. These are two places that I really want you to, to really dream, if you will. To really dream as we're going to, as the very first part of our, our core value is, how are we going to do this? Is we're going to act justly. Is we're going to be influencers in the mental health. We're going to create an environment where we're influencing and we're ministering and we're loving. I want you to notice and how do we do this and, 
in, in, in multiple ways, and I want you to allow yourself to dream. But but I want you to to know know to you that how did God how did God do it? How did God minister to Elijah in this place at this time? Nourishment and rest. What did he tell Elijah to do? He says, get up, eat, drink, rest. And then I want you to notice what he did again. He says, get up, eat, drink, rest. Get up, eat, drink, rest. Get up, eat, drink, rest. We see that in Elijah. He needed to be fed. He needed to be nourished. He needed nourishment and he needed rest to continue in the journey that God had for him. Several years ago, in a ministry that I was ministering in, we got to the point where there was a lot of needs, specifically where um, we were, we were ministering in a community in, in a part here in the United States that was at the time in the state that we were ministering in that it was the third largest county in the Midwest and, and where we were ministering at for meth labs. And we had, we were, as a church, had people coming from all walks of life that were in, in need of, of help. They were in need of Care. They were specifically in need of counseling. So we started praying, God, how can we minister to this need? How do we become influencers in this need? And one of the partners that we were partnering with, uh, another uh, organization that had a counseling service, they were actually training counselors and they needed, get this, they needed, because of the state where we're in, required for you to get your professional counseling, you had to get, have a certain amount of hours to counsel. So they were, if you will, um, uh, partnering with those to get their hours in. Um, where they could actually take their, their test and become counselors, um, licensed counselors. But they needed a place to get their hours in. So we partnered with them, and we were able to actually open up an office on our campus there at the church where we were able to use these counselors that were partnering with other counselors that we were actually able to offer free counseling service to the people in the community to influence in that community in that specific need of dealing with mental illness, depression, anxiety, bipolar, drug addiction, all of that. I remember a time when um, came up with this idea that we would, um, one of the ministries I was in, where they would, hey, um, there, there's a desperate need. There's so many people that are going without food. I don't know if you realize it or not, but the two largest groups, in, in, in specifically in America, that are, are going hungry are, of course, our, our children, our kids, but also senior adults. And uh, we decided to start this soup kitchen. And we set the time and prepared the food, and nobody showed up. Next week, same time, prepared the food, nobody showed up. Next week, same time, prepared the food, nobody showed up. We did that for about a month and a half, maybe even for two months. Same time, no food, I mean same time, Prepared food, no one showed up. Come to find out, we didn't realize it, but at least in this specific part of the country we were ministering in, it, it, there was a kind of a stigma, if you will, a stigma attached to this whole the idea of that uh, soup kitchen, and people didn't want to admit that this was the one thing that, although they needed food, they didn't want, they were still in, in, in this whole idea of pride, they didn't want to, they weren't willing to, to say they needed to go to a soup kitchen. So we just, clever idea, I don't, I don't even remember who came up with it, all I know is it wasn't me, well let's just change the name. So we just called it free lunch. Same time, Prepared the food. 
People are everywhere. So we had free lunch. I think it was on Wednesday, so I think we called it Free Lunch Wednesdays. Now, the reason I'm sharing those, throw, just throwing those out there, out there to you is because I want to just challenge you to dream. How do we minister to and, and create an environment where people can rest? How do we create an environment where people can experience nourishment and, and they can repeat in that rhythm over and over again? Why? Because God's not done with them yet. Why? Because it's for home. And everything we do is for home. Why? Because we believe. We believe as a church. We believe as a community of believers. Why? Because of who we are. We are a community that's in love with Jesus in such a way that influences our neighbor to find and experience the healing love of Jesus. And we want to act justly. And we want people to realize that God's not done with them yet. Even those that don't even, those that don't even realize that, that who God is. That they don't realize that God's even got a plan for them. We want to create an environment where they can realize, where they can rest, where they can fill the, get filled with the nourishment that they need. Because as they experience Jesus and the healing love and power of Jesus, that God's not done with them yet. So they need that nourishment. They need that rest. To be able to be all that God wants them to be for the journey for home. For that journey for home. See, that's what we see in the life of Elijah. We see that Elijah went and on, on that journey and got to the point, a place where he actually experienced God and, and God shared with him his mission. He said, This is what I want you to do, Elijah. I want you to go, and I want you to find this man named Elisha. And this is where you will find him. You're going to find him plowing in this field. You see this in verse 19. You're going to find him plowing in this field. And I want you to, to, to in other words, what God is doing is saying, you know what, Elijah? I want you to prepare the individual that's going to come after you. I want you to prepare. In other words, I want you, you to disciple Elisha. And we see there, it goes on in verse 9, it says, there, there, <coughs> excuse me, it says, Elijah, he finds Elisha. He says, there were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Eli Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. Eli it goes on to say, Elijah went and over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulder and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah and said to him, first, let me go and kiss my father and my mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. In other words, there's this, there's this kind of uh, this, this dialogue, this whatever you want to say, going on between Elijah and Elisha. And Elisha knows that, hey, I'm supposed to go with Elijah. So Elisha's ask, asking first, can I go and kiss my mom and dad goodbye? And Elijah replied, go on back, but I want you to think about what I have done for you. In other words, I want you to think about what is going on here. I want you to think about what is going to transpire. You, that I want you to think, Elijah, Elisha, I want you just to be present. And I want you to think through all that you are about to experience and this decision that you are about to make. Verse 21 says, So Elisha returned to his oxen and he slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. Elijah discipled Elisha. But I want you to think where Elijah was at. Elijah was at a point in his life that we just talked about where he was struck 
with panic, with fear. He was at such a place in his life that he asked God to end it, that he asked God to take his life. God came through his messenger and angel and he gave Elijah food and drink and he instructed him to rest. He gave him food and drink and he instructed him to rest. And Elijah had this rhythm. Why? That it prepared him for this journey. This journey where he met God, where God instructed him to go and to meet Elisha. May we be a church here at Central. May we be a community, an influencing community that's influenced community where we are acting justly. Why? It's for home. It's for home. For our GPS leads us home if we're following the GPS. For everything we do is for home. Now I want to pray. I want to encourage you that wherever you're at and the environment that you're at, that, that to take part in just setting aside a time to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, to remember communion. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.